to be the grizzly bear recovery coordinator for the Fish and Wildlife Service. And uh, Rich and I are now the co-chairs of the North American Bear Expert Team. This is the first of a series of webinars that the North American Bear Expert Team will put on on a fairly monthly basis on topics. And um, we welcome you all today and we'll record this as Rich said, and, and uh, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. So this is a, um, a summary of grizzly bear recovery in the United States as of this year. Um, a chronology of events for the grizzly bear. Um, grizzlies were first reported by the Spanish eating beached whales off of the California, on the California beaches in 1602. They were described on the Canadian prairies um, in 1691. Lewis and Clark encountered a lot of uh, grizzly bears when they went across the U.S. and back in 1804 and 1805. And after that initial encounter, um, grizzlies were excessively persecuted throughout most of their range until 1975 when they were listed under the Endangered Species Act. Um, direct persecution was the major cause of grizzly bear decline and extirpation. So um, every method was used to try to kill them. This is a, uh, an old painting from 1916, but it typifies the attitudes about bears in general and grizzly bears in particular um, in the 1800s in the Western United States. Uh, it's important to realize that strychnine, that poison, was the main killer of grizzlies in much Western wildlife. And um, this is a quote uh, from a book says a supply of strychnine was part of the outfit of every shepherd and by means of this, the number of bears each year diminished until many sections where they were formerly very abundant, they've entirely disappeared. And strychnine was produced in, by the ton and was highly used throughout the West from 1860 to 1885. Um, wolves were also uh, poisoned and trapped during that time period and uh, this is a picture of a wolfer here about 1900 who would catch wolves and sell the pelts. And this is a big pile of wolf traps. So trapping um, as well as shooting and poisoning were parts of the uh, extermination program. This is the, um, the former range of the grizzly bear throughout most of the Western United States down into central Mexico and then in Western Canada all the way up through Alaska. In the dark uh, areas you see are the present range of the grizzly bear. Um, and those are the areas we'll talk about today. This is the range of the grizzly in 1922, estimated to um, be found. In, and you can see there were grizzly bears down in Colorado, um, Nevada, Arizona. And um, this year, 1922, is the last year there was a grizzly bear in the state of California. And California to this day has the grizzly bear on its state flag. Uh, so the irony was that they, they had grizzly bears and thought enough of them to put them on the state flag, and yet they killed every last one by 1922. So to sum, summarize the history, once abundant across the prairie, uh, present throughout the mountains of the Rockies, and most abundant in California, the state with the most grizzly bears, uh, where the last one was killed in 1922. Intense persecution eliminated them from the prairies by the 1880s, which is important to recognize. You know, there, there were estimated 30 to 40 million bison on the prairie uh, at the time that, that white people encountered the prairie. And um, the bison were essentially gone by the 1880s, too. There were probably about 325 bears and the, excuse me, 325 bison left by the 1880s. So that extirpation program was not just um, bears and wolves and carnivores, it was also bison. Mountain populations were reduced to small isolates, were, which were really vulnerable to extinction by the 1920s. And the lowest numbers of grizzly bears probably were in the 1930 to 1940 period, which is also the peak period for the, um, uh, the grazing of domestic sheep across lands in the Rockies and most of the West. So this is the estimated decline of grizzly bears. The population was thought to be about 50,000 at the first, the time of first encounter. This is in the Western United States outside of Alaska. And the population decline was precipitous. And 
the lowest numbers were probably in that 1930 to 1940 period. There's no survey data to, to substantiate the exact numbers, but looking through the historic record, there's hardly any record of even mentioning grizzly bears in many areas of the world in the Western US um, during that time. And gradually there's been an increase and you know, today we've, we've got more bears and we'll talk about how we got there. The recovery story starts in the national parks. Um, there was a long history of actually promoting access to garbage inside the parks for bears, where they would just dump the garbage from visitors inside the park. Um, and that resulted in high numbers of bear human conflicts. Uh, from 1931 to 1969, there were an average of 48 human injuries per year inside Yellowstone National Park and 138 uh, property damage incidents. And these, these data are from Kerry Gunther, who is a, um, a NABIT member and is on the, uh, the call today. Um, but what's remarkable is this number right here, 48 <laughs> human injuries per year in Yellowstone Park. Imagine that happening now and the big outcry that would occur. Um, this are pictures of bears eating garbage in the park. It was something that was accepted and something people thought was fun and they would actually take tourists out and watch, watch the bears eat garbage and um, provided um, feeding facilities called lunch counters. They set up bleachers in places and it's remarkable to think about this today when we think about bears and garbage and human foods and all the effort we go to prevent this. It wasn't that long ago that people thought it was a fine idea. Then something happened. In 1967, two women were killed by grizzly bears, two different grizzly bears, in separate places on the same night in Glacier National Park. And both of these bears had a history of feeding on garbage that was dumped inside the park. There was also garbage available in Glacier National Park. And this prompted reconsideration of how grizzlies were being managed in the national parks. So this incident inside a national park started to generate thought about grizzly bears in general. And finally, the availability of tons of garbage to bears inside the parks was recognized as a bad idea. And the dumps were to be eliminated and the closure of the dumps was a very contentious issue because some people like the Craigheads who had been working in Yellowstone thought that would result in the extinction of grizzly bears. Others thought that it really needed to be done and, and um, created a lot of controversy. So with the closure of the dumps, there was an increase in the numbers of dead bears as the garbage was phased out. Bears spent more and more time associated with campgrounds. Some bears went outside the park and came into conflicts um, in surrounding areas. And in 1974, um, the grizzly was um, proposed for listing under the Endangered Species Act. And in 1975, it was actually listed as a threatened species. An interesting note here is that when it was proposed for listing, there were 500 comments um, received on this um, listing decision. And you compare that to the 190,000 comments that were received uh, when we proposed to delist the Yellowstone population in 2007. So um, a lot more interest in grizzly bears, a lot more participation by the public in, the, in public activities, the management of wildlife. And um, that, those two numbers are a stark example of how many more people we've got interested in grizzly bears today. So why was the grizzly bear listed under the Endangered Species Act in 1975? Um, these are the actual statements that are in the listing document. The overall reduction in range, um, the fact that there was livestock grazing, timbering, and road and trail construction. Uh, there was indiscriminate illegal killing and excessive control actions. There were the possible impacts of the isolation of populations that was thought of in the original listing. And finally, the rapid closing of the garbage dumps in Yellowstone, which resulted in, quote, the dispersal of bears outside the park. So the, the, the listing um, prompted people to begin thinking about all of these things. And that was the task of the recovery program was to address all those issues. So this is the assumed range of grizzlies in 1975, the blue areas you see on this map. 
And um, remember that 1922 map here where we th saw grizzly bears in many isolated populations. By 1975, all of these, these populations down here were gone. Of course, there were no grizzly bears in California anymore. And what we saw was these island populations become, um, they evaporated into the small areas that you see here today. And um, it's important to note that three of these populations were contiguous with Canada and, and survived because they were along the border. And it's important to note there was Glacier National Park up here and Yellowstone National Park here. And in fact, the only reason we have grizzly bears in Yellowstone in this ecosystem today is the fact that we had a national park um, to provide a refuge for those bears. They would have been gone by 1975 without the park. And it's fair to say that Glacier was really a foundational area to maintain grizzly bears in this ecosystem as well. The bears that existed in these two areas, the Cabinet Yak and the Selkirks, were probably dependent on that connectivity with Canada. After 1975, we found that there were no grizzly bears in the Bitterroot area. And um, um, you can see that there were there in 1922, but by 1975, they were gone. And essentially, the populations in North Cascades were functionally extinct. There might have been three or four bears right on the border here, but functionally, there's, there's no bears in the North Cascades either. So recovery started in 1981. Um, a recovery plan was developed that listed the tasks necessary to achieve recovery. And um, recovery coordinator was hired. And there was still need for agency cooperation uh, in 1983. So the Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee was established. And it's important to recognize when we talk about um, cooperation between agencies, we had a lot of state agencies that felt they were, um, they, they opposed the idea of listing grizzly bears. Um, they thought that the federal government, which was determining the and running the Endangered Species Act should not be involved in the management of state game animals like grizzly bears. And the states adamantly opposed the listing and they didn't wanna participate in recovery. Um, and then all the agencies where many of them were really turf driven. For example, the national parks didn't really care much about what occurred outside. The Forest Service said, well, we deal with timber harvest and things like that. We don't deal with wildlife. It's real hard to get everybody to work together. So what was created was called this Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee. And you can see all the members of this committee. Interestingly enough, it did in, in include Canadians because we had so much Canadian connectivity and Canadians throughout the entire recovery process have been critically important to the success of the recovery program. So it's a transboundary trans -boundary issue. And by getting this committee together, we began all the agencies to cooperate together toward a common goal. So why did they, the Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee make a difference? First of all, committed agencies to a common objective. And this common objective was important. And it was high level officials to sign the document actually the governors of the, of the four states and the assistant secretaries of agriculture and interior at the federal level. It provided an accountability link between the decision makers who were the signers of the document and the agencies um, uh, to implement the recovery plan. And it provided a structure for interagency cooperation. So the committee met twice a year, talked about how things were going on the recovery program and this meeting structure and the fact that there were um, groups or subcommittees assigned to recovery in each ecosystem were really what made it function. So those three things, commitment, accountability, and structure were critically important to seeing um, grizzly bear recovery happen. So successful management of, of any animal and grizzly bear management in particular requires four things. And many times when people think about recovery programs, they just think about biology, um, but it's a lot more than that. It's kind of like the legs of a table and without several legs on the table, the table will fall over. So the biological data is the science and all the details that we have to understand what bears need to survive and how human activities affect bears in various ways and what sustainable mortality limits are and all that type of thing. 
And we've been blessed with great science and, and excellent scientists that have supported the system. The organization people to manage are essentially all the agencies and all the professional biologists working together through this interagency grizzly bear committee. Political support was really initially developed because grizzly bears were really visible. Everybody knew about Yellowstone grizzly bears because of the work of the Craigheads and politicians didn't want to see grizzly bears disappear on their watch and so they signed on to be involved. And we actually had governors signing on to recover grizzly bears, something we would not get today. Public support really was developed in many ways, but fundamental to public support was the fact that all the agencies said the same thing. They all told the public these things were necessary for recovery. And by getting the same message from everybody, the public began to believe that and buy into the program. It's really important to recognize that if you have agency divisiveness and the public sees one agency doing one thing and the other agency doing another, then they tend to just say, well, we don't believe these guys. So cooperation was fundamental. And then political and public support really came from the fact that we could actually achieve recovery. It was something that was doable. So the four things that were done um, to recover grizzly bears, the first was mortality control. Um, and reducing conflicts, which resulted in fewer dead bears, increased habitat security, particularly with motorized road management. Sanitation was enhanced to get garbage controlled and, and all those open pit dumps were closed and we got the public to start storing garbage properly. And we built public support and understanding for recovery public began to understand what grizzly bears needed to survive and how those needs could be met through their, their public activities. Gradually, the number of dead bears declined as conflicts declined and more females lived longer and had more cubs and the populations began to increase. But that created management challenges. And um, what we ended up with was more people living in bear habitat and increasing numbers of bears, which resulted in management challenges and, and <laughs> those management challenges continue today. So we are not out of the woods by any means. You know, more bears means more, more activity for bear managers. So increasing numbers of people combined with increasing numbers of bears create conflicts. Uh, Montana's population has increased 334,000 since 1975, and the numbers of grizzly bears are at least four times what they were in 1975. Um, that is a challenge to bear managers, and that challenge will continue every day uh, from now on into the future, trying to balance the needs of bears with the needs of people. Um, this is an example in the northwest corner of the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem here. Um, 279 different grizzly bears have been captured um, 475 times from 93 to 2020. Um, and these are conflicts of one type or another. Conflict activities related to poultry, garbage, bird feeders. Those are the main types of things that get bears into trouble in this semi-urban place. And 161 of those 279 bears have been um, either destroyed or had to be sent to zoos. And this is the bear management challenge that we face. You know, this is the, um, how we're, we're challenged with our success in places like this because more bears means a lot more conflict. So the overlap of more people living in bear habitat with more and more bears results in these conflicts. And, and this is the kind of thing that bear managers are used to seeing, you know, nice manicured grass in the spring, which brings bears into yards. Um, and then the, what we call the leading bleeding edge of bear management. As humans expand into bear habitat and bears expand their range into human habitat. And this picture typifies that. These things usually don't come out very well unless there is intensive management. And of course we can manage certain things, but we can't manage people very well. Um, and that's our challenge. 
So some evidences of recovery and one that has been very uh, enlightening and, and positive is the expansion of denning onto the prairie. Um, grizzly bears were gone from the prairies by about the 1870s. And um, since 2009, we've seen female grizzly bears start to den out on the prairie and have cubs. And this is an example of what grizzly bears did um, prior to the advent of, of Europeans coming out there. They would den in places like this. This den is 40 kilometers from the mountains and there's no trees around this den for miles. And this is a den where a female had cubs and came out. Here's the den location here and there's the mountains 40 kilometers in the distance. And there are a lot of these, I'd say a lot, but there are, there are several of these dens out there and females that are raising cubs on the prairie and living on the prairie. And it's been a hundred years probably since this happened um, from 2000, since before 2009. And that's a refreshing thing to see. Carcasses, when, when animals die, um, they tend to attract grizzly bears to the site where the dead animal is. And we've instituted programs to either relocate the carcass to a place where the bears can get it, which is what's happening here, or pick the carcasses up and take them away so the bears aren't attracted. And if you've ever seen a bear smile, that's what that bear is doing right there. He's come out of the den. You can see this is the, uh, the 12th of April, and he's found this dead carcass that was placed in this remote site, and uh, he's very happy about his find. And this, we have places where there's a lot of protein in the diet of bears, particularly on the east side of the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem. And um, um, this produces some big healthy bears. Some of these bears are, are pushing um, over a thousand pounds in, in the fall. This is Mike Madel, by the way, of Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks with this bear. So how the populations changed over 40 years, um, you can see the numbers here, 1981 and 2021. 1981, we had perhaps 550 bears and today we've got 800 and 1,880 plus. Um, the biggest gains have been in the Northern Continental Divide and the Yellowstone populations where those populations, we started out with several hundred bears each in those places and recovery actions allowed those populations to increase fairly significantly. The smaller populations, the Cabinet Yak and the Selkirks, where we started out with very small numbers of bears, these are very um, uh, sensitive populations. And even with intensive recovery efforts, it's taken a while to increase those very much. We are making progress on those areas, but it's still a gradual process. So there's the, the distribution numbers, um, NCDE at 1,000, Yellowstone at 750 or more, Cabinet Yak is 55, and the Selkirks at 75. And of course, there's no bears in the Bitterroot uh, or the North Cascades at this time. 93% of the bears in the lower 48 states now are in these two ecosystems, the Northern Continental Divide and the, and the Yellowstone system. So these two maps uh, will give you an idea of the range expansion of grizzly bears. Um, this is the Yellowstone ecosystem. Uh, the range is the dark green that you can see there in 1990. This is the range in 2018. The yellow area you can see is the recovery zone, the original area that we wanted to have intensive management for recovery. Um, when the bears were listed, they were all within the recovery zone. And by 2018, there are grizzly bears expanding in all directions around the ecosystem, pushing outward, um, southward, moving toward Utah. We'll eventually get grizzly bears in Utah one of these days and moving out onto the prairie, um, private land and, and conflicts out there. This is the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem. This is 2004. Um, you can see that the bears occupied all of the recovery zone in 2004, um, and by 2018, they had moved out considerably onto the prairie, and these are the places where we were seeing those den sites, out in places like that, 
And these bears are also moving southward as they get move south, they'll get closer to the Yellowstone population. So both of these are, are good examples of how recovery has been successful in these big ecosystems. Bears have occupied all the recovery zones and they've started to push out. Uh, recovery is still underway in the Cabinet Yak ecosystem, which is this area right here. Um, we've got two times as many bears today as in 1975. It was much smaller when we started. Um, and this is an area that we've done augmentation. We've actually moved bears into this population. Um, we've made slow progress, uh, but progress nonetheless. The Selkirk ecosystem is this area here on North Idaho and laps over into British Columbia. Two to three times as many bears today as in 1975. Again, a smaller population to start with. And this population has recovered because of its connectivity with, with Canada, a place that Michael Proctor's work a lot in this area. And the bears have um, moved back and forth and reoccupied much of the US side of, of that ecosystem. So we're making progress in those two areas, but much slower than the bigger ecosystems. And the failures, and we admit these failures, the Bitterroot ecosystem here, um, we had a reintroduction plan uh, that was completed, but it was never implemented and um, uh, because of political interference. And um, we will see, we're seeing some natural movement into this area. And I'd like to highlight the fact that Wayne Caseworm will present a, a, a webinar on this, uh, watching bears uh, move down into this ecosystem and the evidence that Wayne is seeing for this kind of movement. That'll be in, in the future here, that webinar. And then in the North Cascades, um, we had a reintroduction plan that was started, but it was stopped by political interference once again. And the adjacent Canadian populations are on the verge of extinction and really cannot help out as we saw in the, in the Selkirks. So those two big wild places, we haven't been able to make much progress and it's basically because of the political problems that have occurred. You know, why, why was this failure? Well, we didn't have as much public support in those ecosystems. Um, uh, entrenched -ish interests, particularly agricultural interests that were opposed to grizzly bears. And the political forces felt that they could not support it. And so uh, between the, the politics, um, shutting down the funding for the process um, and a lack of some public support, those two recovery programs were stopped. So Yellowstone um, and the Northern Continental Divide have recovered. Uh, they've met their recovery goals, um, but they have yet to be delisted or removed from the Endangered Species Act. Recovery and, and delisting are two different things. Recovery is mostly a biological and a social process. All the things that limit mortality and conflicts. Delisting is a legal process, um, moving them from the list of of endangered species requires a lot of legal review and, and um, um, what happens after delisting? What does delisting mean? Well, it does not really mean that management and monitoring will cease. In fact, the management and monitoring that got us to recovery should be continued under what's called the conservation strategy, which is a document written for each ecosystem as to how we will continue to manage mortality and conflicts and monitor the population. That's what it's supposed to happen. Adequate regulatory mechanisms must be in place for delisting to occur, and they must remain in perpetuity um, after delisting. And this is what's called the conservation reliant species concept. I, I want to uh, highlight this, in pa this paper by Scott et al. kind of outlines the fact that some animals cannot live on their own. They live with humans and they need to be carefully managed. Their habitat and their mortality needs to be managed if they're ever gonna survive. And grizzly bears are certainly a conservation reliant species. So recently a new threat has developed. Um, it's anti-predator hysteria. And um, it is sweeping the, the Western United States, particularly the Northern Rockies. And it's generated essentially in rural communities. You find urban communities supportive of predators by and large, but the rural communities are much more sensitive. For grizzly bears, they fear grizzly bears. Um, 
and they've been successful in convincing state legislators to pass laws that threaten adequate state regulatory mechanisms. Some of these laws are, for example, that people can shoot grizzly bears that they think are threatening livestock. Threatening is an undefined term. Uh, means anybody can shoot a grizzly bear at any time, essentially. Um, that grizzly bears will be not be relocated if they are captured in any conflict outside the recovery zones. Um, and legalizing next snaring of wolves and extending the wolf trapping season into the time that grizzly bears out of, are out of their den. And this is what results from that. This is a wolf neck snare around a grizzly bear. The snare was chewed off by the grizzly bear, but he was still wearing that and eventually it would have killed him. Here's the, what a neck snare does around the neck of a, a grizzly bear. And this will also happen to black bears. You know, these snares are set along trails. The animals walk through these snares they tighten and they will never loosen and never come off. Most bears that get caught in these snares are strangled. The other issue is, is leg hold traps. Here's a grizzly bear in a leg hold trap uh, set for wolves. Um, these bears do not like this. They tend to chew on the, um, on the snare, um, or excuse me, on the trap and on the chain. You can see the, the blood around the mouth of this bear, broken teeth. And here's a picture of a, a leg hold trap set for wolves with two grizzly bear claws in it. This trap um, was being dragged by this bear. He had the chain following behind him and he got hung up on a fence line. Um, and this trap was found wrapped around a fence post with his two claws in there. So the bear pulled part of his foot off to get out of this trap. So this anti-wolf hysteria and allowing people to trap wolves during the time that bears are out will result in these kinds of things for bears. Now we have legislation that will allow hound hunting of black bears in Montana, something that's been legal since 1921. Uh, most areas have, where black bears are have grizzly bears and there will be conflicts uh, where hunters will either kill grizzly bears to defend their hounds or defend themselves. And this will increase grizzly bear mortality and cannot be effectively regulated. Many of these dead bears will probably never find out about because the, these hound hunters will not be willing to own up to the fact that they had to kill a grizzly bear. So all these bills erode adequate regulatory mechanisms. Um, they will make the delisting of grizzly bears increasingly unlikely. And ironically, what these state laws are doing is something that the green groups, the environmental groups have never been able to do. And that is prevent any future consideration of delisting for grizzly bears. So the irony is that what these state laws are doing is preventing state control from ever happening. And it's all because of this newly arisen anti-predator hysteria that's uh, sweeping areas of the Western United States. So as recovered populations get to recovery goals, they should be delisted, but these anti-predator laws are moving us away from the possibility of delisting. So grizzly bear recovery has been successful in two of the six ecosystems. Um, uh, however, political backlash and anti-predator hysteria uh, threaten the possibility of ever delisting these recovered populations. And these are the current challenges facing grizzly bears and grizzly bear managers. So the bears have come a long way in 40 years. We've We've successfully met the recovery goals in the Yellowstone and Northern Continental Divide populations. We've, we're making progress in the Cabinet Yak and the Selkirk populations. Um, we have not been able to reintroduce bears into the Bitterroot and we've been stopped from considering recovery in the North Cascades. So some progress, um, but we haven't been totally successful to date. And it's important to, to thank all the many colleagues and friends in the US and Canada who worked on this effort. Um, this has been a team effort across multiple states and both Canada and the US. And it's important to note that there are numerous North American bear expert team members who are participants in this process. And we're, we're fortunate to have these, these folks in place to do all the good things that they've done. And working together, we've made a difference in the lives of grizzly bears and made a 
uh, future possible for grizzly bears in the coterminous United States. Thank you for the, uh, the opportunity to present this. I hope it's been useful for you. And if we have any questions, I'd be happy to, to answer them. Rich. Yeah, we do, Chris. Thank you. Appreciate it. That was a, that was a great talk. Um, our first question comes from Russ Van Horn. Um, he's wondering, for the conservation of grizzly bears, is the greater impact of conflict from either A, the demographic impact, such as removing bears from the landscape, or from B, the impact of human attitudes and support for bear conservation? Oof. Well, the human attitudes and support determines how many bears we remove from the landscape. So one is directly related to the other. If we have cooperation with the public in securing attractants and not participating in activities like hound hunting and trapping wolves when bears are out, then we have fewer dead bears. So uh, the two are, are intimately related to, to each other. I don't think you can pick between them. Okay. Um, our next question is somewhat similar from uh, Sanzar Kantarbaev. He wants to know, do you think controlled shooting of bears involved in conflict and trophy hunting can solve the problem of bear-human conflicts? Well, if controlled shooting is that we direct hunters to the conflict bear, um, I do not believe that it is a very effective way to deal with conflicts at all. In fact, this has been discussed at some length. And, you know, the idea that if, if you had a bear, let us say, killing livestock somewhere and would come in at night under cover of darkness and kill some sheep and then leave, you know, why not put a hunter on this bear? Well, you can't really successfully take that bear with a hunter because often the, the predation happens when the hunting is not possible. And it's not possible to understand which bear is actually doing it. In many areas, you've got, a, you've got multiple bears and you might have one that is the predating bear, whereas um, if you put a hunter out there, he's likely to shoot the wrong bear and not have any success. So I don't think the hunters are a way to solve the problem at all. And I think there's good records to show that, that hunting in and of itself is not going to, hunting grizzly bears in and of itself is not going to reduce conflicts. Uh, it's a very inefficient way to reduce conflicts. Probably the only way to, that hunting could reduce conflicts between bears and people would be that if you got you killed enough bears, you reduced the population in range and numbers to the point that there wasn't much overlap with people, you might be successful. But it would be a, a draconian approach where you'd have to kill hundreds of bears in order to do that. Right, yeah, try to avoid that scorched earth approach. Um, our next question is from Scott Silver. He wants to know how likely it is that there'll be a natural repopulation in the bitter roots. Well, that's a good question. Um, uh, you'll be interested to hear Wayne's, uh, Wayne's webinar on this. And um, a brief article on this has been written for the IBN News. It'll be in the summer issue, I believe. Um, what we're seeing, and I'll briefly um, say, is that what we're seeing is bears are moving into the bitterroot area, but all these bears are males because males are, are more likely to, to disperse. Females are much more resident within a portion of their mother's home range. They don't disperse as far. And so we're seeing some males in there, but we would need some females to have a population and reproduction. In the long term, we might see females move into that area, but it's going to be long term. And I think if it were, we were going to be successful in getting females in there, we'd probably have to move some in rather than wait for them to eventually move on their own. So we may see bears in there, but we won't see populations probably in the near term. That's a quick answer, but I would ask that you watch Wayne's presentation and read his article coming up in IBN News. You bet. Yeah, and we will be having a a webinar on that topic specifically here soon too. So thanks. Um, our next question comes from Clayton Lamb and it's related to capture, unintended or non-target captures. He's wondering, did you see bears losing toes 
in conibear traps of the 50 or so bears that they've caught in the Southern Rockies in Canada, four of them were missing toes, which they hypothesized might be from fur bear trapping. Um, I don't think it's conibears that would take the toes off a bear. I think it's leg hole traps, that some of these big strong leg hole traps that uh, as you saw that picture with the toes in the trap, I mean, that's how they lose them. Um, they, they get their toes caught in there, then they twist around and eventually they get that chain either wrapped around something or they pull long enough that they pull their toes off. Um, I think we can also see that bears, if you know, there are other types of snares that are used, wire snares, and if a bear puts his, say, puts his paw into a hole where there's meat in the hole and there's a snare around there, if he can catch his, his leg high up on that wire snare and it's, it doesn't loosen up, what will happen is that that'll, that'll kill the lower part of the foot and, and you'll have a three-legged bear. And we've caught several of those three-legged bears that have probably lost their, their legs because of snares that they got caught in. Right. Okay. Um, good questions. Uh, William McShay has one for you. He's wondering, is there any pattern to the expansion of bears into the prairie? In other words, are they following any landscape features or sticking to low density areas? Well, that's an excellent question. What we see is that out on the prairie, we have drainages that move uh, eastward uh, from the northern Continental Divide area, and these drainages, um, they're, you know, they're eroded bottoms, and oftentimes around the, the water, you find cottonwoods and, and shrubs, and then on the bench tops, you find farmland and, and agricultural land and grazing. What the bears are doing is moving down these riparian zones, and during the daytime, they're bedding down in the bottoms in this thick vegetation, and at night they come out and they forage in grain fields or, or things like that. And then when dawn comes, they go back into the riparian zone. And so we find these bears can get way, way out on the prairie. Um, and no one even knows they're around unless they get into conflict. They're down in those, those thick riparian zones and they're quite successful at moving way out onto the prairie by staying in those riparian zones. Right on. Our next question is from Dave Garcellis. Um, he's wondering, how were, the, how were the numerical recovery targets set? And once they were set, were they readjusted as more information was obtained about bears, people, bear foods, et cetera? That's a good question. You know, we, we never could figure out what the carrying capacity would be for bears in any of these ecosystems. And, you know, the holy grail of wildlife is trying to figure out the carrying capacity. So we set recovery goals um, based on um, occupancy of the recovery zone by reproducing animals. We set targets for how many reproducing animals should be seen. Um, and we estimated that you know, if we had a population of, um, let's say 200 to 10% of those or 20 would be females with cubs in any particular year. Um, we estimated these things. And what we set was, not so much a, a numerical target, but limits on mortality. It had to be a, a certain percentage of the numbers that we saw out there, the distribution of females with cubs and how many of those we would see in any particular year. We tried to enhance that information with genetic data over time, uh, particularly understanding in a place like Yellowstone, which is an island, you know, what would a uh, a population size need to be in order to have genetic health. And it's only recently in the past five or 10 years that we've put together our, our genetic understanding to the point that we know that we need a minimum of say four to 500 bears in an island population in order to be healthy genetically. And that became our bottom, our, our floor for recovery in that system. So we never really set a total number out there because we never could measure a total number. We set indicators, um, mortality levels, distribution, and with using the genetic data, a minimum number of animals that we needed in an island in order to have um, genetic and demographic health. And we adjust them all the time. In the latter part of the question, you know, new data would, would allow us to better estimate populations. We would add that into our, our effort 
but we never had a total like, you know, we needed 550 here and 450 there because we didn't know any way when we started that we could even measure them accurately. We've evolved over time. Right. Um, I had a quick question for you. Um, you. You know, you talked a lot about grizzly bears in the news and and some of the decision making that's affecting bears. Um, you know, with grizzly bears becoming more common and really by default being affected by agency decision making for other species, um, how do you think we should tackle that? Do you do you recommend the IGBC be expanded or? Should we try and interact more with the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies or at least the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies to, to sort of stay informed about how this decision making is affecting grizzly bears? When you talk about decision making, you're talking about these legal legal issues that I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, some of the politics, but but you know, some of the agency may be supporting these techniques that by default have negative impacts on grizzly bears? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that, Rich. I think, you know, I'm, I have to admit that I'm really um, disappointed in what's happening at the state level these days. You know, this, this anti-predator hysteria that's sweeping across there. I mean, it's really uninformed. It's barroom biology. It doesn't depend on facts. And we see the, the, the departments, the fish and game departments, oftentimes sidelined and muzzled so that they can't have any input into this. I mean, in Montana, the, the Fish and Game Agency has been totally muzzled and they have no ability to comment on things like, well, if you hunt black bears with hounds, you're gonna have conflicts. They can't say anything. And it's left to the, the, um, the outside interest to try and influence the legislature. So it's a very disheartening approach and something we haven't seen in the past. And, I think it has the potential to be really negative on wildlife in general and predators in particular. Um, it's a most unfortunate development. Yeah, um, Travis Vineyard has a question that kind of expands a little bit on that. We've only got time for one or two more, but he's wondering, you know, that predator hysteria is certainly not a new challenge with grizzly bears. Are you able to pinpoint the tipping point, like the change in public culture and human behavior that led to the recovery and can it be replicated today? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, what started recovery was that bears were so rare and that, that conflicts were very few. And so you didn't have any public feeling or political feeling that, you know, we didn't want grizzly bears around. Um, but as we've been successful, we've been victims of our own success to some extent where bears expand, and you saw in those two maps where the bears were expanding into places, you have bears that are living in places where they've been extinct for over a hundred years now. And in those places, people have no, no experience with bears. They have abnormal fears about bears and how they're gonna behave. And that, that concern about safety and livestock predation uh, has promoted this and this feeling, this anti-predator feeling. And the same thing is happening with wolves. I mean, wolf recovery has been mirrored with grizzly recovery. They both started at the same time. Wolves were extirpated completely from the conterminous United States. Now we have wolves in these, these states and these areas in the Rockies. And we have this huge pushback on the public that, you know, the or at least some of the public, that wolves are eating all the deer and the elk and we need to save the deer and the elk by killing the wolves. And, you know, it just, it's, it's not rational. It's not based on fact. And it's being taken up in these legislative bodies. And, you know, I don't know how we're gonna be able to, to deal with this pushback. We're, and the pushback is because the bears and the wolves are doing well. And there's certain people that don't want them around now. And it's a very different attitude than existed when we started the recovery program. Okay. And probably one final question here. I'm going to group two of them, one from Stuart and one from Michael Proctor. Um, can you explain the importance of connectivity and, and connecting subpopulations and maintaining those corridors between populations? 
Well, as you saw in the maps that I showed you, what we inherited when we started the recovery program was island population. And they were all formally connected. And connectivity is important because it increases the resiliency of those populations. It increases their genetic health. It increases their demographic health. Um, it allows the animals to move across the landscape and reoccupy available habitat that's useful for them. Uh, so connectivity is critical and um, the long-term success and future for grizzly bears will be dependent on reconnecting as many of those ecosystems as possible. Okay, well, I think that's all the time we have. We're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up, but thank you, Chris Irvine, for just a great talk and some great information. Um, I wanna thank all the North America bear expert team members, as well as all the bear specialist group members for attending this webinar. Um, stay tuned for our next webinar on, on agency use of Corellian bear dogs. But for now, we're gonna sign off and hope you all join us again here soon.